something new. <clears throat> Create in me a clean, clean heart. Create in me a work of art. Create in me a miracle. Something real, something beautiful.
Psalms 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. We welcome you this morning as we come and worship God with joyfulness and thanksgiving. We just pray, dear Heavenly Father, how wonderful it is to come together, to come and to be able to worship you, to be able to come and gather online that your presence is here with us and also for those who are watching and participating home. We thank you, God, that you are with us, that you are for us, and that you are fighting on our behalf. So God, we lift up this service for, to you. We thank you for our children and our ministry leaders. And God, we pray as the children learn more about you, may you draw them close, may you teach them who you are. We thank you for our beautiful ministry leaders who love on our children and teach them. We thank you, God, for your goodness and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to dismiss our union This just went off. There we go. I'm going to dismiss our Union Street kids. Um, just a few announcements. Uh, December 4th, we are going to be having a family event for children and families uh, in the morning, 1030 to 12. More information will be coming about that. Uh, we have different things lined up for the Christmas season that we're really excited about. So please be watching. Um, for that information, either your bulletin or online, and if you are not receiving emails, which I try to put out each week, if you could fill out a connect card, that would be really helpful, and by doing that, you'll receive a great little gift bag as a thank you. I'm going to call up Wade. He has announcements for our men's ministry on our men's ministry on Wednesday evenings. Angela. Men's ministry. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, men are meeting here in the church uh, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock every week. Uh, as a group of men, we decided we need an outing. Time to get out of the house, guys. December 4th, we're going to go to a hockey game here in town. The Irishmen are playing uh, 7 o'clock at the Civic Center. Uh, before that, we're going to go to uh, Pizza Delight. Get a little pizza, have a little time to talk, and then over to the hockey game. Uh, we're thinking it's going to be about $25. So uh, to do this, if you're interested, uh, you don't have to only go to the Wednesday night men's ministry. We want everybody to be involved, uh, but we need to know. Let me know if you're interested, and it doesn't have to be just men here in the church. If you want to bring somebody along, please do. Uh, let me know because we need to make arrangements and we will need to know by next Sunday morning service who is interested in going because I'm going to have to get some tickets, going to have to make some reservations and that sort of thing. So we want everyone to come out. Should be a good time. I know whenever we get a bunch of guys together, it is always a good time. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So uh, let's see how many we can get out to this and uh, just come to uh, a bit of fellowship and enjoy each other. And that is it. Thank you.
as morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this time to gather, to learn, and to grow in the word. May we be receptive and obedient to your word and to do as it says. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm really excited today to, uh, to invite Garth Williams up to uh, bring the message. I know for many of you, you know who have met Reverend Dr. Garth Williams. Uh, we go way back. We were in youth group together, and I am so grateful for Garth, for his friendship, mentorship, and leadership. He has worked the last 12 years at uh, CBAC, bringing leadership to our local churches. So please come on up, Garth.
All right, let's try this again. Good morning. morning. Really great uh, for Heather and I to be able to be with you today. And uh, Angela, it's good to have you here today, too. Every time I've been here to speak since you've come, you've not been here. So this may be my last time here. Okay, some of you got that. That's good. (laughs) I don't know about you, but over the last 18 months, I've unfortunately had to watch more TV than normal. Anybody else? Yeah. How are the Netflix subscriptions doing? Yeah. So... Over the time that we've been sequestered or we've been locked in, I've tried to explore some new TV programs that I maybe haven't seen in the past. And I came across on Netflix this sci-fi series called Sweet Tooth. Now, I don't expect anybody else has watched that, but just a question, has anybody seen Sweet Tooth? Okay, so I'm not a solo uh, guy here this morning. The premise of really is about what happens in the midst of a pandemic. It's based on a comic series that was written in 2009 and then began production as a TV series for Netflix in 2019, long before we knew what coronavirus was, long before what we knew lockdowns were, long before we knew what circuit breakers were. There began to be this sense of the story of a pandemic that they begin to explore. And in the midst of this pandemic, one of the crazy things that begins to happen is that some children begin to be born as hybrids. And when I say hybrid, I mean half human and half animal. And it raises great curiosity amongst all of the globe as to what's going on and how is this happening. Some begin to hypothesize that because of the viral pandemic, it's created these hybrids. And on the flip side, others are saying these hybrids, whether wherever they have come from, are responsible for the virus. And there begins to be this tension in culture about what to do with the hybrids. Some want to protect them. Some want to study them. Some want to capture them and begin to do exploratory examinations and testing to see if they hold the source of a cure. And so in the midst of all of this, you begin to ask the question, How do people treat those who are marginalized in a time of crisis? Or how do those, how does society treat those who are marginalized in general? At the core of this story is one of the hybrids. In fact, it's the first hybrid who ever came into existence. Gus is his name. Also known as Sweet Tooth because he has this great penchant, and I can identify with this, and Peter Groom can too, for candy and syrups and anything that's made with sugar, sweet tooth. And in the midst of it, sweet tooth begins to kind of try to understand his identity. And he goes on this great journey with friends to try to find out where his mother is. And there's these other themes that weave into the story of mentorship, a pursuit of something that is precious, needs to be pursued at all costs. And there's also, how do we protect ourselves when we ourselves go into disarray as a society and we begin to question allegiance to one another. Throughout, there's trauma, distrust, and a question of ethics. But the concern about how we treat marginalized individuals in our society is nothing new, is it? In fact, that theme, although brought out in this story and many other stories, is as old as what we know of ancient history. From a time of slavery and stealing land, of of nations warring with one another to take uh, what they perceive to be something that they want, Egypt, Israel, Babylonian nations, Rome conquering all of what we know of Europe because they had a thirst for power and authority and running over those who were marginalized, who weren't like them, who didn't think like them, who didn't have the pedigree that they did. Even colonial settlers, the issue of 
stealing land of slavery and of treating those who are of a different skin color or of a different ethnicity different because they're not us. We see that even in the last 24 months, don't we? It's been hard to watch news without coming face to face with some of the realities that we still deal with an amazing amount of racism within our context. Fear, hate, the frame of they don't deserve it. And even the concerns and the marginalization have slipped into things like a health concern around a pandemic. Political sides being drawn, division being created. And through it all, the main theme, our depravity leads us to be selfish people. Thinking that we are better than others or wanting to protect ourselves because we are afraid of what we don't know. For you and for me, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, Scripture is not silent on this issue. Scripture speaks often about those who are marginalized, those who have been set aside or cast to the edges by the society that they're a part of, and how the church, how followers of Jesus should respond and engage and react to that. And I can think of three specific that I'll touch on this morning, but it's not an exhaustive list. But the three that I can immediately think of are issues around social standing. Uh, That's economics, financial ability, viability. The issue of gender roles, the issue that the church has struggled with for so long about equality between the genders and ethnicity about those who come from a different heritage than what we do. You excited to dump into this? You haven't fallen asleep yet? Is this what you thought you were going to get this morning? Probably not. In Corinth 11, it's often known as the passage that Paul writes about communion, about the Last Supper. And often for those of us in our tradition, when we celebrate that, We often would read some words from 1 Corinthians 11 about the the body and and the blood, the, the bread and the cup. But what's amazing about the story in 1 Corinthians 11 is what was going on in the Corinth church that caused Paul to write those words. You see, they didn't celebrate communion in that context the same way we do. They actually referred to it as a love feast or as the Lord's Supper. And what would take place is that they would gather on a given day and that people would bring food and that they would share that food with all of those who were there. Now, in principle, it's a beautiful, wonderful way of how we care for one another. Think about those in the church who would be financially disadvantaged for a variety of reasons. When they came to the love feast, there should be food that they could just eat and be sustained and have, feel that love and that care. It was an opportunity for those who were uh, wealthy or who had done well in business to be able to care for others, to be able to look after the needs of their brothers and sisters in Christ. And yet in Corinth, the exact opposite was happening. You see, in an economic disadvantaged situation in, in Corinth, those who were disadvantaged, maybe slaves, whatever the context would be, had to work long hours. And those who led a life of leisure because of their wealth base were not taxed by time. And so when those who weren't taxed by time, who had the financial resources, were coming to the love supper, they would come in with their food and they would gather around and they were not waiting for those who were disadvantaged to come and join them. They started the meal without them. They started to eat. They started to drink. And Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 11 really challenge that and says, do you not have homes to eat and drink and get drunk in? Why do you have to make a mockery of my house? Meaning just the general sense of God's presence in the building. And he chastises them by saying, your arrogance, your self-centeredness, your lack of sensitivity to those who are marginalized economically is saddening, disgusting, frustrating. And the challenge for you and I is the same. How do we care for those or how do we engage with or what do we think of those who may come from a different financial perspective of what we do? It's very clear 
what Paul would say. It's very clear what scripture would say. That for those of us who follow Jesus, we should be treating one another equally. We shouldn't be setting ourselves up in some way to say, well, because I give more money to the church, my vote should be greater. Or because I come from a position of wealth and standing, then I should be served. The scripture has always reversed that. (laughs) That the least should be served. Social standing. Something that has divided the church from its very beginning. Something that we continue to see exist within our context. Something that scripture would call us to challenge, to speak out against. Gender roles. There's this great passage in John 4 where Jesus engages with the Samaritan woman. And he and his disciples have been traveling for a while. And they come to the well and they don't have any food and they're tired, they're hungry. And so they come to the well and Jesus says to his disciples, you guys go ahead, find us some food. I'm going to wait right here. So while he was waiting, the Samaritan woman comes along. And she comes to draw water. And he says to her, he says, hey, can you give me a drink? She's horrified. She's horrified for a couple of reasons. One, because he's a He's a Jew and she's a Samaritan, and we're going to see this, you know, in a little while, that dynamic. But here is this story where he's asking a woman for a cup of water who he doesn't know. And in this context, it would be incredibly scandalous that he's asked this question if he could have a drink of water. And she's like, "Mm." as they engage in conversation, as they spend some time talking, as Jesus presents to her a different way of living and a different way of having uh, her thirst quenched, his disciples come back. His his disciples join in and uh, come to see what's going on. And they're quiet while Jesus is talking to her. But you get a clear sense in John 4 that the disciples are greatly concerned that Jesus is talking to a woman, that they're shocked and they say it seems, it seems special that they didn't ask why. Like they make this identifier. Of we didn't ask why he was doing this. But they're shocked because Jesus is engaging with a female within this context. There's no doubt that throughout the church's history, it has struggled to see gender not as a divider. And in the scripture, the way that Jesus engaged with women on a regular basis would point out for you and I as followers of him that the gender should not be a divider in how we care and look after one another. So guys, (laughs) your voice shouldn't be more respected or more valuable within the assembly. Sisters, you have the equal rights that I would ever think to take. The division of, ethnic, or of gender needs to be challenged. And the third one for ethnicity. In Acts 10, Peter had this incredible vision of this sheet being laid out in front of him with all foods to, on it. And on that sheet, laid out before him in his vision, were foods that were prohibited to him because of Jewish food laws, because of restrictions on diet, because for one reason or another, they had been declared in the Old Testament as unclean. And the Lord says to him, get up and eat. And he goes, no, 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 I can't. And the Lord says, get up and eat. And he goes, no, no, I can't. And he goes, get up and eat. And Peter has this breakthrough moment where he realizes that he's able to eat foods because of grace. Because God has given him permission to do so. And that leads him then to enter into a relationship with his Gentile friends in a whole new way. And he began to eat foods with them that he would not have been able to eat otherwise. And he begins to minister to the Gentile community, the non-Jewish community, in a whole new way as he goes to their table and eats with them, not afraid of the food restrictions. And then in the midst of this, he goes back to Jerusalem for a visit. He goes back really for a missionary report to the church. 
And he goes back to tell them of the ministry that's going on and what's happening, what's taking place. And you know the primary question that he gets asked? Hey, are you hanging out with Jews or with Gentiles? Are you eating at the table of Roman soldiers? Are you actually hanging out with non-Jewish people? That begins to be the primary focus that they zero in on. And so as a result, he backs away. Eventually he finds himself in Galatia, ministering to the church of Galatians and engaging with the community there, which is primarily non-Jewish. And he meets up with a guy that we know uh, as Barnabas. And he and Barnabas in their ministry begin to engage in a similar way that he had previously had of eating in the homes of Gentiles, of sharing food and table uh, with those who were non-Jewish. And representation, representatives from the church in Jerusalem come to see how ministry is going on. And as word comes that they're traveling his way, do you know what Peter does? Peter stops meeting with the Gentiles. Now think about this, if you had a friend who came to your table for the last seven Thursdays and they said, oh, I won't be here next week because my mother-in-law is coming and she wouldn't like me to be hanging out with people like you, what would you do? You'd be a little bit offended, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you wonder about what motivates somebody to be able to be with me when certain people weren't around? And that's exactly what happened to Peter in this context. Peter hears that there's representatives coming from Jerusalem, and he remembers the last time he was in Jerusalem, it didn't go so well because he had been hanging out with non-Jews. And so he thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to pull back and not worry about it. And the thing is that not only did that he not only did he do that for himself, but he also influenced Barnabas to do it as well. Issues of ethnicity. And Paul heard all of this. And Paul had come to work with the church in Galatia as well. And he wrote the book of Galatians, a letter to them addressing some of these issues and some of these concerns that he had heard. And he writes these words in Galatians 3, 28 and 29. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. And you'll know this part really well, I hope. For there is neither Jew nor Gentile, ethnicity. There is neither slave nor free, economic diversity. Male, nor female, gender issues. For you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise. Paul writes to this congregation that was struggling because of issues around ethnicity, issues around gender, and they would have heard of the issues around the ethnic or the economic disparity out of the church in Corinth. And Paul doesn't want them to be diluted or to be confused or to be able to misrepresent the gospel. And so he challenges them to be aware of this truth. That for those of us who walk under the banner of Jesus, it doesn't matter if you're Irish or if you're Scottish. Because we all know the Welsh are best. It doesn't matter if you grew up in Charlotte County or Kings County. It doesn't matter if you're from the U.S. or the U.K. It doesn't matter what shade the pigmentation of your skin is. It does not matter. Because there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither Jew nor Greek. In the eyes of those who love us, in the eyes of those who matter, 
With the eyes in our Father above, he sees us equally. And that's the same for our economic standing, and it's the same for our gender. That we are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all equal in the eyes of our Father. And if we're all equal in the eyes of our Father, does it not just follow through in common sense that we should learn and actively seek to treat one another in the same way? The gospel calls us to understand our brokenness and our unworthiness. You see, part of the problem that we struggle to be able to do that of equality with each other is because we wrestle with our own brokenness. And if we can understand that we are saved not by our works, but we are saved by grace, (laughs) that God has done this great work, then we will not take arrogance in our salvation, but that we will take humility of knowing that God has done this and not me. You know, I'd love to tell you the story that for Sweet Tooth, that the world changed and that people saw the light and they stopped experimenting uh, on the hybrids and they stopped marginalizing those who were different. They started embracing those who were scattered and marginalized by society. But you know what? You gotta wait for season two for that. (laughs) But, But let me challenge myself and you in this way. I believe that the gospel calls us to be people who are humble. To recognize that salvation is a gift from God and that you and I have not earned it. We have done nothing special. We have not been born into the right family. We have not achieved it because of financial success or of our reputation in society. Salvation is a free gift of God. The other thing is for us not to remain silent and to speak honestly. So often we hear comments made, don't we? Whether they be of an economic issue or whether they be of an ethnicity issue or whether it's even of a gender issue. And we should not remain silent, but we should speak into it the love and grace of Christ, challenging both our brothers and sisters in Christ and giving a different take so that the world around us can see the values of Scripture lived out in our lives. And I believe we're called to embrace the differences Heather and I have the privilege of going to a church which when we're able to meet in normal times has over 24 different nationalities represented on a Sunday morning. We have one of our churches in the Halifax area. It's a historic African United Baptist Church and if you don't think we've wrestled with racism, we have a whole association within our family of black churches in Nova Scotia. And we continue to work to find a way where we can learn from one another and that we can serve one another. But in one of those churches, they have 29 different uh, ethnicities represented on a Sunday morning. Beautiful, rich, the conversation and the expressions and experiences of faith make those congregations strong. They could be a division point, but they make them strong because their leadership have recognized the diversity, the beauty, and the unity in the body of Christ. Let me just encourage you to create a scandal of grace, to live your lives both as individuals and as a church in this community, as a place where people say they love regardless of who you are. They care for you regardless of whether you come from the other side of the tracks, They love you regardless of what your bank account says. They love you regardless of your gender. They love you and they care for you. Let's create a scandal of grace together. Let's pray.
God, you call us to be people of love and of mercy. You call us to be people of humility. Well, God, remind us today that we have not earned our salvation, that you have given it freely as an act of grace. And in that, remind us then to treat others with humility, the same way that you have treated us. Help us not to disrespect those who are of a, are of a different nationality, maybe even a different generation. Help us not to make decisions on who we will hang out based on their economic standing. And God, may we learn to give both men and women an equal voice so that we can walk like Adam and Eve did side by side. And in all of this, may you use us to reflect your hope and your joy and your love to the community around us. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Let's see if we can uh, have our eyes open, our eyes opened, I should say. Father God, we thank you for the message. Open our eyes, the eyes of our heart. Eyes of my heart.
Father, as we step out these doors, may the message we receive today be brought forth to our communities and the places that need it. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.